Good evening, good afternoon. I don't know what time it is, four or five o'clock. Uh, my name is Ashok Guru. Uh, I'm the director of India China Institute. I'm really delighted uh, to welcome all of you to this uh, special, I would say, conversation, get together, uh, and also an occasion to celebrate uh, and partly to learn from, uh, you know, what uh, uh, some of our grant recipients, student grant recipients have used uh, a bit of resources that the institute was able to provide as uh, student grants uh, have done during their summer uh, explorations in India and China. So, so really, uh, Today is about uh, what you know, New School is all about, that is to really to engage with students, to uh, support what students are here for, in terms of you know, both you know, uh, uh, advancing and uh, pursuing their formal degree, as well as learning in a broader sense of the word. So I think uh, I'm happy that many of you have decided to come uh, and uh, be with us this afternoon. And I know that many of you are here also to learn a bit more about India China Institute, uh, uh, both you know, in terms of the kind of work we do and the kind of support we provide. So, so I want to talk about that. So let me just quickly go over uh, a bit about you know, who we are, what we do, and how you can uh, get involved with us. And then after that, uh, I'll ask uh, our grant recipient students uh, to talk a bit about their work. Uh, I know that they can talk for a long time because they had such an amazing experience, but we have asked them to just give a, a bit of a, you know, a teaser uh, glimpse into what they did during the uh, summer. Okay, uh, I think uh, as most of you probably know, we are a unique uh, entity within the new school. It's one of the very few entities that really is truly university-wide initiative. We are not part of any department or uh, school. We are a university-wide you know, center. Uh, that means we deliberately look for and welcome engagement of students and faculty members from every part of the university. Uh, so this is something that you know we are very proud of, and we want this to continue to grow. We were established in 2005. Uh, our really uh, very you know uh, primary, I would say, uh, purpose uh, is to look at India China, both historically and from a contemporary point of view. Look at how this amazing story that is developing, uh, you know, uh, in the 21st century. And what can we learn from you know, engaging with India-China story, what can we contribute towards that, and how can we apply that, even if you are sitting in Latin America or Africa or in the US. So I think that's, broadly speaking, is what uh, our primary focus is. It's centered around uh, supporting teaching, research, uh, and you know, building of uh, networks, building of a community of uh, scholars who are interested in this story. Okay? Uh, it's unique in the sense that there are many centers uh, of similar nature uh, in major universities in the U.S., but what makes our center very unique is for the first time in uh, higher education, uh, we are looking at India, China, U.S. together. We recently heard that Stanford University has also decided to establish a center called China India Institute, I guess, you know. <laughs> so, so someone is following us a little bit. But, but I think that's unique in the sense because it uh, directly uh, challenges the earlier notions of how you study different parts of the world. There was a concept developed in early you know, 60s, partly supported by uh, an entity like Ford Foundation, where I used to work many years ago, under the, uh, uh, this idea of area studies. That means you carve out different parts of the world, Central America, South Asia, uh, and you develop scholarship. So departments, centers are created around those you know, ideas. And what that did uh, when it comes to India-China, we share almost 4,000 kilometers of border, that these two countries were never studied together. Right? So New School, you know, despite its uh, challenges, decided to really challenge that and look at India-China together in relation to 
uh, you know, uh, US, right? So in terms of intellectual frame, we basically are interested in three large intellectual frames. One is what can we learn by focusing on India-China interactions, both historically and in contemporary context. Second is the comparative frame, right? Uh, by comparing the two countries, especially you know, if you think about, let's say, poverty alleviation or environmental issues, even though these two countries have very different systems, what can we learn by looking at their experience, both positive and negative ones? Okay. The third storyline that we're interested in is uh, the joint impact of reemergence of India-China on Africa, or in Africa, right? Uh, or Latin America, or US, Europe, in, on its neighbors. So I think those are the storylines we are following, and in that mix, students, of course, are very central to us, because we are part of the university, and a lot of our faculty members, and here I want to thank some of our faculty you know, colleagues who are here, uh, faculty advisors, and our Leaping is here. Uh, who uh, really are engaged in this uh, very uh, you know, modest but very important effort uh, to really think about their own research, to think about their teaching, and also helping us expand the networks with you know, various universities and think tanks in India and China. Okay. So uh, here you will see three of us, and Grace is sitting here, ICI office manager, Grace. Many of you know her. Grace actually runs the place. It, he, she definitely makes me run. <laughs> and uh, we have Mark Frazier, who is unfortunately, he could not join us today, but uh, if you are interested in the China story, uh, he is one of the uh, you know, leading scholars who has done quite a bit of work on labor issues and looking at you know, uh, urban you know, space in China. Uh, so. Uh, so I think, uh, in regard to students, uh, what do we offer? How can we get you, you know, engaged or more engaged? I think uh, we obviously have uh, student research grants. And these are, you know, small grants, three thousand dollars, but I think they are important. And you will soon hear from five grant recipients what they did with this uh, modest, but I think uh, I hope the timely contribution. Uh, we, uh, there's a program under Emerging Scholars Symposium. Uh, we do have you know, several volunteer as well as you know, research assistant uh, opportunities uh, at the uh, Institute. Many of you uh, have worked with us. Uh, and each semester we uh, do have a few openings. So I would say you know, stay engaged. And if you're interested in, send us your resume and talk to us. Mm. Through the institute, as I said, when you know we, we offer a lot of uh, uh, or we support a lot of courses that are taught by various colleagues. So if you're interested in India China story and you want to find out what kind of courses are offered, you can go to our website and you know and you can learn more about them. Next uh, semester, I'll be I'll be teaching a course on uh, uh, global Himalaya rethinking culture and ecology. We have a project funded by Luce Foundation uh, that really has. Uh, enable us to go deeper into looking at both the transnational dimension of how a place like China, India, and a small country like Nepal, relative to India and China, are struggling with these questions of, you know, how do you look at energy questions? How do you look at environmental questions? How do you look at ethics? I know. So, so I think uh, there are a number of similar courses that you could, you know, find okay, and benefit from. Uh, our website, we believe, is becoming a, a really a good resource for many of you who are either writing a paper or want to you know, explore India-China in whatever ways you, know, you wish to. So I would really encourage you, uh, if you are uh, you know, writing on any aspect or anything related to India-China, to go to our website, because some of the most interesting thinkers, uh, you know, policy makers, leaders, have gone through the Institute's you know, public you know, program and they have given lectures. Many of their lectures are videotaped, so they are available on our site. Uh, as you know, uh, when people write their books, it takes a long time. But here they come and they share their ideas as they are developing. So, so I would encourage you to check out our website. Mm, and of course, we, all, we all organize a series of uh, lectures, uh, colloquiums, seminars, conferences, and uh, I would encourage you to, if you haven't done it, sign up uh, you know, for our mailing list. 
That way, you, know, you will know what's happening and uh, come to those events. Uh, I think a bit more on the student travel and research grant. The deadline has been extended. Now it's October 27th. Uh, and uh, I would really encourage each one of you, if you haven't done so, and if you qualify, to apply. Because uh, even if you are, you know, not necessarily uh, becoming an expert of India-China, I think uh, we at the Institute like to argue that India-China's story is going to shape you know, all, all of our lives. So take this opportunity, at least try, and go to India and China. We do give prior to people who are not experts on India-China. Uh, if you know India well, then I think your chances of getting that grant is lower. You know? so, so, so we give prior to people who are new to India-China's story. So, so in that sense, you know, uh, you know, if you know India well, try to go to China. If you know China well, try to go to India. Okay, so that's the that's the spirit behind you know this particular grant. Right. I think uh, one key thing you need in order to really be eligible, besides writing a good uh, you know essay, is uh, find a faculty member who you tell you know about your uh, ideas, and someone has to support at least in principle, that they will oversee your project. That's very important because we want faculty members to uh, you know, know that you are thinking about India and China in a certain way and you need their support. So I hope many of you will apply and after everyone has spoken, if you have any more specific questions, we can you know, try to respond to them. Mm. I think all of this uh, detail regarding requirements and process is on our website. So go to our website. Uh, I've already talked about job opportunities, volunteer opportunities. And, and I think uh, many of you know that uh, at the new school there are many, many wonderful you know, possibilities you know, for volunteering and you know, getting research assistantships. But working with us, uh, we feel uh, we, uh, you will be part of a community of you know, uh, peers where uh, we do uh, you know, attract people from different parts of the university so you will go beyond your you know, uh, immediate network of school or program you're enrolled in. So that's very attractive to many of our research assistants and volunteers. Uh, I think uh, it's, it's a nice little community. So, so come and you know see us uh, if you want to you know uh, you know be uh, involved in, in in either as a, as a volunteer or as a research research assistant. Mm, these are some of the sample courses that are being either taught or will be taught uh, uh, during spring semester. Mm, I think I mentioned to you a bit about. Our website really is a resource. A lot of these uh, talks are now uh, on our website. In terms of upcoming events, these are some of the sample events that you know we will be hosting uh, in the near future. Please, you know, if your schedule allows, come to these events. Uh, okay, I think that's a brief kind of an overview. Uh, I think at this point what I would like to do is go right, you know, into our, you know, hearing from our students. Each one of you, please take five minutes. I know you have much longer and much more interesting uh, story to tell, but I think today we're less limited to what is five minutes each, and that would then we will go into Q and A. We will take about ten, fifteen minutes to just respond to your questions, either to them or to me. And then we want to hang around. I think hopefully there's still some food left, some drinks left. And feel free to just get up and get something, you know, from the table. And uh, keep listening and keep engaging. Okay. Hi, everyone. My name is Carolina, and I'm from Italy. I'm an undergrad uh, student in design and management, minoring in Chinese studies. So I thought the best way to tell you what happened more than the research itself was to show you my uh, website. I put up a blog in my website, which is nextblur.com, which is called The China Explorer. So it's day by day, every day I did this. And I'm going to flip through them like really quickly because I only have five minutes. But um, 
So the bad, the bad, the bad and the good. Um, well, I went through a lot. Um, <laughs> so got involved into like a like a mob thingy. Like people were protesting in front of the cellular store. I was gonna get my SIM card back. That was interesting, <laughs> but uh, this is the boon, Shanghai the boon, um, amazing. And uh, this is a supermarket, if you guys are interested. Um, so this is our other people that were there. And first of all, I wanted to thank everyone that gave me this grant, and my teacher, Li Ping, everyone at IC, uh, ICI, it was amazing, and thank you. So this is the our campus. Um, oh, some funny. Oh, oh, sorry. Oh, no. Um, so, China is an amazing place. A place where people walk their birds instead of walking their dogs. As you can see by the picture, that it's kind of not showing. It's Right, yeah. I think so. people have now a sense of your blood. Don't they? Exactly. Yeah. Well, it was just to show something. Yeah. Um, but the thing that I loved the most about Shanghai was that the first week I was there, not speaking very well the language, I was kind of lost because everyone spoke in Chinese where I lived, and I went there by myself. There was no one with me. And then after the first couple of weeks of going through all this thing and adjusting, I understood that. In China, it's not that people, like, well, the first week I thought that people didn't want to talk to me. It wasn't that I didn't want to talk to me. It was just that I didn't, you know, I couldn't really communicate with them well, and I just went in thinking, oh, these people are just mad at me. They're talking to me with this weird accent. Like, why, are, why do they look mad? They weren't looking mad. They were just speaking using their tones, and I couldn't understand that that was why they looked so mad, but they were just trying to be friendly and trying to explain to me what I was supposed to do. So after I understood, after I was able to grasp the language and understand my surroundings, it was an amazing experience. And um, as far as my research goes, I was able to interview the ex-CFO of Nike and Polaroid, and he gave me some really good insights about how the market in China goes, meaning how now China has become so independent because so many people relied on producing things in China, that now China is starting to make the things that people were asking them to do for them. It's trying to start to do that, 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 that kind of stuff by themselves, which means I have to buy a new phone because I lost my phone in China. I bought a Chinese phone that looks exactly like an iPhone, was cost $100, and that's the example of how China is now able to do the things that we ask them to do better than us for their own market. And I think this is why it's considered such a threat, but I see it more as an opportunity than a threat. And I think that that's like the most important thing that I took from this whole opportunity was to understand that you may have so many misconceptions about China and so many things that they told me when I started to study Chinese, which was that China is gonna take over and whatever. I mean, of course it is because we allowed for that to happen because we gave them, we wanted them, like it's kind of like we use their resources and now we get mad because they're better than us. Like they learned and we should just appreciate and understand how they were able to do that and emulate them, I think. And so that's as far as my research goes. But other than that, um, I think you should definitely try, try to do the grant. I'm an undergraduate student, I tried and it was amazing and I definitely, I'm much more comfortable right now with China, and I want to pursue these studies, finish my minor, and continue studying Chinese, because it's awesome. Great. Cool. So hi, I'm Joe Wheeler. I'm a, a second year in the MFA in Transdisciplinary Design in Parsons the New School, um, and specifically focusing on transmedia storytelling and how we can use media to engage audiences, raise awareness, and um, challenge discriminatory social norms. And so for ICI, what I was looking at was specifically in the context of international advocacy media, how can we, specifically me, as an outsider, um, come into communities and make representations via media, photography, videography, 
of groups of people in a way that's respectful and empowering, but still starts to demonstrate how kind of dire some of these circumstances are when you're looking at um, really systemic social issues. Um, but don't worry, I'm not going to talk too much about the nitty gritty theory of that. I'm going to show you guys what I did, and it's mostly pictures. So, um, To do this, I got in contact with a really small human rights NGO called Nazdik. It was actually three female lawyers, all in their mid-30s, um, who started this organization and are super passionate about bringing justice closer to um, minorities and women, specifically in India. Um, so I was working with them on both um, some media advocacy campaigns as well as just general marketing for their organization. They're so small, they don't have much time to spend branding themselves, but obviously in the world of NGOs, funding is huge and how you let people know what you're doing is a big part of getting funding. Um, so here's the first example I have of kind of the work I was doing. Um, this is a photo of the Kaputli colony, which is an informal housing settlement in Delhi. Um, where Nazdik is currently working, and if you think of a, a New Delhi slum, this might be the image that comes to mind. Um, but one thing you might not think about is the kind of community of empowered individuals and educated individuals who are working with Nazdik um, to fight for their right to stay in their homes, um, currently facing wrongful eviction. What you would even be less likely to realize is that um, it's a community of artisans uh, that take their craft very seriously. Completely actually translates to puppet, and there are a lot of puppeteers in the um, colony. This is Puran Bhatt, who is a nationally recognized puppeteer. He's met the president. He's been to Europe, Canada, and America, and you would never think that this is someone who would live in a New Delhi slum. At least I wouldn't. And you can see his beautiful puppets that he made and took the time to show us, and that's his son. Um, the next big thing I did was I uh, helped Nazdik document the workshops they're running. This is a workshop they did with 25 women from um, Gold Market Informal Housing Settlement and Nangloi. That's wrong, uh, but um, these are 25 very active and passionate women who are um, working to know their rights regarding wrongful evictions. Um, so these, yeah, these are the photos of the workshop itself, which, which went really well, although none of it was in English, so I assume it went really well. I was told it went really well. Um, <laughs> but Nazdik uh, put these photo, this photo series on um, their website and on Facebook and got 40 likes, which they said was the most likes that they've ever received, and they were blown away by that. So you can really see how kind of a small effort towards this can really go a long way for a small organization. And she was the only workshop participant who actually enjoyed letting me take pictures of her. <laughs> and that's a marker on her face, not some weird scar or anything. Uh, one of the next projects I worked on was a series of infographics to help kind of bolster the campaigns Nastik is currently working on. Um, specifically, they're working in Assam, India, um, in tea plantations, looking at minimum wage. And this is starting to illustrate the daily wage in Assam compared to other tea producers, compared to the cost of Assam brand um, tea. Um, you can see the workers in Assam receive uh, about $1.57 per day for plucking tea. That's eight hours of work. Um, compared to other places in India where they're paid much better but still pretty bad. Um, compared to what we would pay here in New York to buy that tea, um, just a single pack. So kind of using visuals to start to illustrate that uh, inequality. Um, this was a breakdown of the daily wage on top of the uh, 94 rupees per day that they're earning. They actually, uh, tea managers deduct from their wage costs for um, retirement, food rations, and electricity. And this is actually against the law, according to the Indian Constitution, but it happens anyway. So the take-home pay is closer to 70 rupees per day, obviously not a livable wage. Um, and then this is a follow-up to that previous infographic that's breaking down 
the new wage that Nazdik is proposing to be the new base minimum wage in Assam and in tea gardens across India. Um, the next big project I worked on was a write-up um, regarding the same tea campaign. Um, and it actually was published in the Hindustan Times. You can see that's my name Wait. as a co-author. <laughs> um, and it was published. <laughs> So this was huge for me in terms of my career. This is my first publication, and it was very exciting to make this happen. Um, read it, it'll be on ICI soon. Uh, and the last thing I worked on, uh, Nazdik just received a grant with uh, Every Mother Counts, and they work on maternal mortality around the world. And Nazdik is the first organization that they have sponsored in India. And one of the requirements of that grant was that Nazdik puts out uh, storytelling regarding the work they're doing in India. So I worked with them to make a long-term strategy of how they can present their work via photography, videography, and blog posts, trying to balance some of the harder work, like making videos, with easier stuff like blog posts, and timing it over the course of the year-long grant so that it was manageable for them as a group of three working mainly with freelance um, artists and designers. Um, and then I made the first installment of that, which was a photo series. I did not take these photos. I can't take credit for them. They're amazing. Um, I didn't have a chance to go to Assam. But looking over the photos that they had, again, from other freelancers, I combined them into this photo series that they released on the Every Mother Counts website, both as kind of raising awareness of what Nazdik is doing and pitching the work there. Um, so again, it's looking at maternal mortality. So this is the uh, hospitals in Assam. But again, we're trying to represent kind of the full picture of this and not just the sadness of it. So this is the cover of the campaign. And I think it's good to show that these are healthy and happy people that are in circumstances that are pretty unacceptable. and in a lot of ways out of their control, but that doesn't mean that they're constantly looking sadly at cameras. They're also happy with beautiful babies. Um, but I didn't just work while I was in Delhi. Did I even say I was in Delhi? I might have skipped over that. I was in New Delhi, <laughs> India the whole time. Sorry. Um, I got to have delicious chai tea every morning from my <laughs> B&B. Um, and I did some tourist stuff around Delhi. This is um, Humayun's tomb. Yeah. It was beautiful, it actually inspired the Taj Mahal, but very few tourists were there, um, as illustrated by me chilling with Humayun alone inside the tomb. Uh, and it was like empty, and that was amazing to me that I got to experience this without any of the crowds. Um, this is Kutub Manir, and it's in South Delhi. It's an archeological complex with this really beautiful spire at the middle. This is Jantar Mantar, which is maybe not as impressive, but I'm a big fan. Um, it's a bunch of architecture installments that are oriented for astrology, so looking at stargazing. And I was an architecture undergrad major, so I had to swing by and check this out, because it's totally bizarre, but really cool. <laughs> and then I also visited uh, Red Fort, which is kind of the famous site in Delhi. And it was packed. This is right after Independence Day, so they're still taking down some of the stuff for that. Um, and then on my last day, when I was totally fried and stressed from the chaos of India and Delhi, I went to the Baha'i International Center, they have a, the Lotus Temple there, and sat for about two hours. It's a silent meditation hall, and they do a kind of interreligious um, service, and it was so beautiful, really peaceful, and a great way to spend my last afternoon in India. And yeah. That's what I did with my 26 days. Yeah. Hi, my name is Michaela, um, and I just wanted to start by thanking ICI and the Star Foundation for um, this amazing opportunity to really um, is transformative for me in a lot of ways. Um, so today I'll share my research with you from China and Cambodia. Um, initially, I set out to study the relationship between garment factory workers and the clothing that they themselves wear. Um, but during my first interview, I realized that there was a much more urgent need, and that's just to document the life stories of the men and women who work um, in the global industry and who rely on mass manufacturing um, for their livelihood. 
So as out of the 15 conversations that I had with um, workers from three different factories, two in China and two in, uh, one in Cambodia, um, there were two main themes that emerged um, through our conversations. One is the craving for independence through business, using skills garnered from the industry, um, so sewing skills, or um, in the case in Cambodia, it was um, a shoe factory. So, uh, and the second was self-sacrifice for the sake of their children or other members of their family. Um, and so today I wanted to share four of these stories with you quickly. Um, so uh, this is Ding. He works incredibly hard to provide for his daughter, who is a university student studying in the United States. And he works as an ironman, so he irons all of the clothes um, after they're done being sewn and before they leave the factory to go to the store. Um, he works seven days a week, uh, pressing garments at his usual factory, and if he can't get overtime there, then he goes to another factory in the area to find um, more employment. And he thinks it's most important to him that his daughter's able to complete her education so that she can have a successful life. Um, this is Leng in the striped dress. Uh, she's the mother and her daughter, Zheng, is in the gray. And um, she brings her daughter to work if, uh, at the garment factory with her when she has school vacation because she wants her daughter to um, experience factory life. She wants her to experience the work, and she hopes that it will encourage her to stay in school longer and complete her education so that she can actually um, have the opportunity to maybe live out her mother's dream. Um, her mom wants to become, wanted to become a fashion designer, and she hopes that her daughter will have the opportunity to do that um, if she wants. And uh, this young woman, um, is maybe 18. Uh, her name is Unit, and she's incredibly shy, um, really sweet, but she likes to hang out with her friends during her days off, and she lives at home. She travels back and forth from the garment factory every day into the, um, uh, back into the countryside. And she actually liked to make clothes when she was younger uh, for dolls and, um, for her friends and for herself, and she thought that she wanted to be a seamstress, but um, there are too many obstacles for her. She doesn't understand how she can make that happen for herself. Um, so uh, the last story is um, Chana, and she's a mother of four. Um, she also cares for her sick elder sister, um, and she's constantly worried about money and um, is unable to send her children to school every day because she doesn't have enough money to do that. Um, and she talked really freely in the interview about her circumstances in life and her philosophy on bringing up children and the changing culture um, in Cambodia. Uh, so these four stories, um, I think, exemplify the types of conversations that I had. And they illustrate the dependency and the struggle that workers have um, who are part of mass manufacturing and, um, and the struggles that they have every day that they live with. Uh, most of the research produced, it's a, or most of all, the research um, is a set of stories that show various trajectories and capture the aspirations behind a global industry. Um, the stories humanize the products that we welcome into our lives so easily, um, and they show these products uh, not just as objects, but as moments in someone else's life. So, um, to make this information more available um, to the public outside of the university, I created a website um, with all 15 of the interviews. You can go and explore um, the conversation through video and photography, and also read a full transcript of the interview. And for those of you who know Chinese, you can read it in Chinese too, um, in Mandarin. <laughs> and um, so I, I would really love to continue this research. It was so inspiring for me to, uh, to start the work. And uh, I'd love to go to other countries across the world and um, gather stories.
from the industry in that country. All right. So, hey everyone. Uh, my name is Tomas. I'm, uh, uh, I'm in the last semester of the Media Studies program. And uh, first, as well as uh, my other um, grantees over here, uh, I, I want to thank you also. One year ago, I was also uh, sitting in the same presentation, uh, kind of like brainstorming in my head, thinking about what was going to be my projects or what was it that I, I, was, I wanted to challenge myself with. Um, not only the fact that going to another country where I, you know, I haven't uh, ever been was in and of itself a great experience, but how can I challenge myself into actually making it something uh, you know, worthwhile and meaningful? Uh, probably down you know, after it. So I came up with uh, an idea, uh, basically it's a research documentary uh, that I named Sounding Walls. Um, it's a documentary that explores music as a tool for youth empowerment. And um, I'm, my background is mainly in music and in media. Uh, I was also a music teacher for kids back in Colombia, where I'm from. Um, I've been always uh, kind of interested, interested in the way that music plays a, a big role in people's lives, uh, whether it's consciously or unconsciously. Um, I think, well, it definitely is a, like a universal language among different cultures, and uh, it, it doesn't matter where you go to, even though, you know, as you were saying, that it's very hard to communicate the language that you don't speak. Sometimes I think music crosses that barrier and it makes it even easier. Um, India has a truly both rich culture and set of traditions. I know Joe also experienced that not only like in the tourist areas where, where you know, is, is the, like the first barrier of experiencing people, but actually when you go and delve deeper, uh, you get a whole different story. And, um, well, of course, its music is one of the big and most important elements uh, of its culture. I guess, well, with, with several thousand years of, of history, um, it's not just about Bollywood or, or Slumdog Millionaire, but um, but there's also a lot, a lot like uh, even each person, even uh, each community within each city. Uh, you can also say that Mumbai is a completely different country from from Delhi. Um, it has a lot of uh, a great mix of cultures, traditions, and, and history at the same all at, at once. And although it can be a little bit overwhelming at once, but after that you just understand that uh, they're just people like you and me, obviously in different uh, situations. But uh, but it's very it's very interesting. Um, after that, well, understanding that music is uh, well part of this globalized and uh, ever so more you know globalized uh, country or or world that we live in right now. Um, I, will, I wanted to know how music influences uh, the younger generations among that globalized environment uh, just regarding what country they're from. So that's why I got in touch with music. Um, it's an organization that is based in Mumbai and with music centers in Jaipur, Delhi and, and Pune, among other uh, little towns. Um, this was founded by Australian cricket player uh, Brett Lee. You can see them right there. Um, he's, well, as many of you probably know, cricket is uh, like probably the most watched uh, sport in, in India, and it's uh, very famous, everyone is completely uh, like here with football, obviously. So, Red Lee was uh, a complete like phenomenon over there. Um, and you can see probably in the, in the music uh, YouTube channel, there are a lot of videos that promote, and obviously for fundraising efforts, but you can see how people just, you know, go over him even more than, all the, you know, Bollywood, uh, Bollywood stars. So one of the most important things that I considered uh, when thinking about the project was that I wanted to document my experience. Um, again, I come from a music and, and media background. I like audiovisual uh, projects. So I wanted to well, to document this and document how music is actually a protagonist in, this, uh, in these kids' lives. I started to think about what would be the best way of uh, getting to know these kids and uh, their experience with music and how it has played a role in their environment. Um, the first uh, place that I, go, uh, that I went to was Darabi. Uh, Darabi is uh, probably one of the largest slums in Asia. Uh, I think right now there are other slums around Mumbai that are actually uh, surpassing that, that uh, yeah, the, the bigness, you know, the, the length of Darabi. And um, we went there with Astrid, which was one of the, well, she's one of the translators and she's one of the music staff uh, that works at music, at the Music Foundation. And well, initially, my main goal was to talk to the kids, but through the organization's mobilizers, we found that um, their parents were very interested in talking about their kids and music. 
um, at the beginning, I, I obviously didn't know what was uh, what I was going to encounter. So I was saying, all right, at least if I get the stories of at least three kids that are you know living in in, in the in the slums and working with music, uh, it's going to be a great experience. But more and more people just got you know people uh, got interested in talking about their experience. Their parents, uh, they even some of them took off work, and as you know, the wages are very low. But it was even more important to them than going to work to to talk about what they felt about their kids and, and, and the music foundation. Uh, well, for some of them, obviously, it was well, some of the first times that they actually met someone from the organization, because, um, well, it's, it's a very busy life. Um, Govandi, which is, uh, well, another slum, the Mangur Govandi, uh, has sprung up from the base of the DONR dumping ground. It unfortunately has the lowest human development index in the city and is constantly like in the news for uh, malnutrition deaths. Um, and one of the biggest problems in this growing slum is unemployment, obviously, and the fact that parents more, more than often disregard what their kids are up to. So there was a study that recently showed that uh, there's even more probably uh, than 1,500 kids are drug addicts. Uh, Whatever they, they, they can, because obviously one of the phenomena to that attribute to that is that they're not going to school. They don't have uh, obviously uh, like after school programs, and um, and on the other important fact uh, is that child labor is uh, on the on the rise, uh, especially in the slums. Um, so this is why the music centers within those these communities have been so important. Um, so through a guided curriculum and group activities, children will have the opportunity to learn, express themselves, and grow as a person through music. Um, well, this, this curriculum places a specific like focus on, on literacy, obviously, and, and numeracy. So teaching children basics in English as well, and math, through music, uh, to support their formal classroom activities. And well, to instill knowledge like among the children who are not in school. So basically, the aim of the program is not only music and dancing and, and singing, but also using music as a tool for development, knowing that these kids come from a very vulnerable background and they live constantly in that same background. Um, it's, it's a very well, tough situation to see them where they come from, uh, but then immediately when they enter these music centers, they, they you know, they're kids just enjoying sharing with people, uh, being very, uh, you know, uh, extroverted. And through the interviews, uh, we got to see that well, and, and the video sessions, uh, we experienced how these kids spent all the entire afternoons practicing. And this was the first time the organization was actually paying attention to what the kids were saying. As I mentioned before, the audiovisual uh, projects that they have is always to for fundraising efforts. So they always show that we're at least supporting this and, and they haven't shown actually what the kids are saying uh, some with actual results of uh, where they started and now where they are at. Um, Obviously, as we were talking about India, well, India offers a lot of uh, history and culture and tradition. Um, Mumbai is a little bit difficult in terms of it, its way. I, I believe it, it's a little bit more chaotic, not only because of the traffic, but it's also very hard to, to take footage or, or film around the, the, the city. Because, especially after the terrorist attacks of 2008, um, you, know, you, you can't just take the camera out in the train station and take a cell phone picture, it's very hard. So I had to kind of like manage my way to get more footage, uh, both from because I wanted to see how was the environment. Not only you know a talking head telling, oh yeah, my experience in music is nice, etc., but also try to engage not from the version of the slum, the millionaire uh, version of India, but also like the normal city, uh, how they commute, how they uh, engage with people within the you know their like the rhythm of the city and the rhythm of their own day-to-day uh, -day activities. Um, I also got to experience Independence Day, and uh, which was well very cool. I, and, and another festival, which was very funny, called uh, Govinda, which uh, is based on, on Krishna, uh, one of the gods. And the idea is that they make human pyramids, um, probably about nine people on top of each other, uh, to try to break a bowl filled with butter. So it's a very super dangerous thing. I mean, I saw like I don't know. In, in the span of two hours, probably 30 different human pyramids at the same time going up. And you can see, you know, a nine-year-old kid just go down the floor. And then really just walking around. So I was like, oh my god, this is super dangerous. And, um, and he was the only one with a, you know, with a, like a little vest. And I was saying, you know, it, it didn't work. And the other one um, that I attended, that, that I was uh, there to experience it was uh, Ganpati. Which is uh, when they, uh, 
it's a 10 day preparation when they um, take the, the um, uh, their god, um, what's the name? Volkanpati. Well, the Ganesh. Well, yeah, sorry, yeah. And they just carry it around, and uh, the little ones until the big one is when they submerge it in the water. It's also a little bit dangerous. Sometimes people just think they're floating, but after they let the little mime go, then they realize that they're actually drowning. So sometimes it's also dangerous, and uh, well, it's not very big. And finally, um, well, it, it was a great experience overall. The documentary, hopefully, is going to be I'm editing right now, uh, so it's going to be finalized by the end of the semester. Um, it'd be great if uh, once I put the, the teaser in the website, um, also like through the China Institute, you guys can follow it. And uh, probably the, the like the one piece of advice I remember the first blog post that I wrote was actually talking about how overwhelming it was actually just to go out from the from the place that I was staying and the you know every single detail, the sound, the smell, the the sight. It was very different from what you experience. And I wrote you know that that was very overwhelming. You know, seeing a bunch of cows and and a lot of dogs all, all over the place. You know, just sitting in the middle and. It's, which is funny, the, the rickshaws and the taxis don't, don't honk at them. They just, you know, drive by. But it's, if it's like a pedestrian, they do honk. So it was, uh, and, and the, like, the commentary was, uh, keep an open mind. And I guess that's like the first, uh, like, mindset that you, that you have to have uh, if you go to these countries and you haven't experienced them before. It's great to keep an open mind. And from there on, it was just, you know, absorbing uh, the majority of the things that you lived through. The people, the, the stories, um, it, it was great. So, yeah, hope you apply and it's gonna be great. Thanks. We want to have a conversation. So, uh, this is actually the story of really the open mind because um, you will see once you um, find out that you have the fellowship, the first thing that Grace and Ashok will start doing is telling you. You need to prepare, who are your contacts, where are you going, what are you doing? So I thought in my mind I have everything set up. I knew where I'm going, I knew what I'm doing, what I'm researching. I wanted to go to archives and study the commercial uh, documents um, of, uh, of the relationship between China and the United States at the end of the 19th, early 20th century. So I knew the archival collections that I wanted to go to. I had set up all my contacts, I was ready to go and I get to Shanghai and um, the staff at the archives looks at me very nicely and says, well, you don't have affiliation with a Chinese institution. We're really sorry, you can't come in. So that was sort of the beginning and the end of my archival research. <laughs> <laughs> so, okay, yeah, I, I need to somehow do my research. That's why I'm here. So um, immediately that became a, um, a plan B story where I thought, okay, perhaps I don't have access to the archives, but uh, the only other place where I can get archival documents is actually the museums. And one thing that is beautiful about uh, China, and particularly um, cities like Shanghai and now in Hong Kong as well, is that when you go to the museums, actually the collections are quite amazing. And what was interesting in this case was not only seeing uh, the archival collections that are on display, but also to see what kind of story China wants to tell about itself, about its own past. And that was uh, in many ways um, what became actually my own project as well, which I incorporated in my dissertation work and which I will incorporate in my postdoctoral research. So I will kind of, I'm sorry, no contemporary stuff except for the ending. Um, this is mostly a historical story which goes back to, of course, this person, I don't know if you can see him very well. This is Lin Zixiu, uh, a commissioner, Chinese commissioner, who basically is known as uh, the person who started the Opium Wars or is blamed to have started the Opium Wars. And I will not go into the details of the Opium Wars or what his role was, but um, seeing Lin Zixiu in the, the museum and seeing, this is a, um, a, what do you call it? A maquette version uh, of, uh, of how he destroyed, I don't know, millions and millions worth of opium. A amazing story that started the Opium War in, in many ways. 
so uh, what is interesting and what, the, uh, returning back to the story of Jesus Hu and the destruction of opium and the wars was that basically the reason why we have Shanghai and Hong Kong today is because of the international commercial treaties that established these two city ports. So one curious fact that I will share with you, maybe you can't see it very well, but it says on this thing, this is a box for opium. It's government opium, uh, British government opium that was sold in Hong Kong until the end of the Second World War. So while opium was banned everywhere around the world, the government had, the British government had monopoly over the sale of opium because they wanted to tax it in Hong Kong. So um, a lot of the story that I, I could get out of the museum was about these colonial and semi-colonial relationships that China had with the international community. But what became even more interesting is that Again, the narrative that I would get in the museums was not one of the Western imperial oppression, which is what you would usually get if you go to Beijing. I think Beijing, you, you, you go to a lot of monuments, a lot of places, and it says, this is how the imperial powers destroy our world. Not so in Shanghai, not so in Hong Kong. Instead, you see the synthesis between East and West. And both in Hong Kong and in Shanghai, you see a lot of uh, conversation of how the West actually was very conducive to the development of, of the East and how, yes, the West came and they probably intervened a little bit in our affairs, but look how prosperous we are now. So there, and, and these are kind of uh, examples of the West in the beginning of the 20th century, but then you get to this part Sorry, this is not fast enough. Um, you get to this part. So this is Shanghai. Right? This is in the Museum of Urban Planning. And this is sort of um, the glorious future of Shanghai that they want to um, um, talk about. And they want to uh, present Shanghai as the gate, um, the commercial gate for the entire world. The synthesis between the East and the West. So um, this is again, this is a gigantic um, map, uh, 3D map of Shanghai that is bigger than this entire space. It's, it's tremendous if anybody is interested in things like that. So then the story of Shanghai, and Shanghai is, as I said, is pretty much um, a product of the international commercial treaties. But the story that they tell about Shanghai is not uh, how the international commercial treaties destroyed um, local relations or displaced people. The story of Shanghai is a story, at least the one that's portrayed in the museums, is how Shanghai only always had the destiny of becoming this great place. So they even have this crazy um, narrative, uh, and I asked everybody that I knew in China if this is, how, how is this possible? They say, the, uh, the Shanghai city walls were round, which is conducive to commerce. All the other city walls in the world, in, in China, are squares. It's only Shanghai who has round city walls, and this is good for trade. So I went around and I asked everyone, okay, what's up with the round city walls? And everybody said, we don't know. <laughs> <laughs> so um, again, it, it's a very interesting narrative that's incorporated into the myth of, of Shanghai as, as this place that always had to um, uh, become what it is. So they also have this thing where uh, they have pictures of what Shanghai used to look like in, let's say, the 90s or the 80s and what it looks like now. So there's this progression always towards development, which is, is in many ways very amazing. So one of the things that I found really interesting, and I'll give you this version, is that there, there were only a few subtle ways in which you can see a little bit of, um, of the descent in, in the narrative of the Western world coming into Shanghai and changing everything. So you, you probably cannot read what it says there, but 
I will only tell you the part that's the most important. So this is the Shanghai Urban History and Development Museum, and in one of the sections it says in the second hall, there is, um, in the first hall, there's features of the old city, the second hall, foreign concessions and stone frame door house, third hall, the metropolis infested with foreign adventures. What? Infested with, this is not what the Chinese version says, by the way. So it was only in very peculiar ways that uh, you could see a little bit of the descent in, in the Shanghai narrative. But at the same time, I thought that this was very productive for my own research. So the only touristy thing that I'm showing you is this building, which I named the Batman. Because it was, <laughs> um, it, it's not called the Batman, it has a different name, but it was haunting me whenever I was walking around. And, and so that's my presentation. Well, congratulations and thank you for sharing a bit about your Adventures. Yes, yes, great. Well, Plan B is always, you know, in some ways, you know, I think we all have experienced that, uh, uh, the most fascinating part of our lives, right? You know, it's what you do with Plan B. You know, Plan A is boring in my opinion, you know, but things go according to how you plan. I think it's fun when you end up with Plan B and you do something amazing with it. That's what the new school spirit is, and I think you all have, I'm sure, encountered many of those moments and some of it you talked about. So thank you really for sharing that. And really, uh, I think uh, uh, we have a few minutes. Uh, I hope, you know, uh, you know, you got some idea of what, you know, a small, you know, opportunity like what we offer uh, uh, can do uh, to you or to your friends uh, who uh, used it. And I would really encourage you to uh, apply to, uh, you know, kind of, you know, explore uh, and to run with it. Uh, for us, uh, it's important uh, to both see things through your eyes, uh, but also to uh, have your involvement. So for us, that's crucial, you know, to be part of a university-wide uh, initiative. So thank you all, and thank you for coming. But let, let me take about 10 minutes. Any, any questions or comments, you know, you can ask about it. Okay, it's for the ones that didn't speak the language. How do you manage? You just talk, um, like, you just kind of, I feel like you just kind of like understand. For example, like for me, like my research was about sporting goods. Like I wanted to see how the sporting goods market worked in China. Mm -hmm. But I knew that to do that, I had to rely on talking to people. So I went to classes of like dancing classes for like sports and played basketball with them. And understood what was the sport culture like before even doing the interviews with the big guys. And I think that if you just trust that you understand them, and if you actually put the effort of like, not thinking that like, they are not gonna talk to you if you don't speak their language, it's gonna come naturally. Like, I'm from Italy, you know, like, I, I, I knew a little Chinese, but I think that if, if, if you're here sitting and you think that you wanna go there, you already have the right mindset that no matter what the language barrier is, you'll be able to understand each other. Yeah. I think. Okay. Now. Keep going. I had a different experience. I don't know if I need this. Um, I had a different experience. Yes, of course, I communicated with people um, through body language and you know, talking, and I knew pe people speak English in, in Asia. <laughs> um, but for the interviews that I did, I worked with a translator. Um, because it's really the only way to get, and I worked with good translators, it's the only way to get accurate information. So if you really want to talk to people and you're interested in what people have to say to you um, and the information that they have, and you're not, you just don't want to guess and make assumptions off of your observations, it's important that you work with someone who speaks the language. So, yeah, I'll hire a translator or find a friend who knows the language. Yeah, and I think the grant, you know, you know, in some ways, you have to figure out, you know, how you you want you want to use part of the money for your overall experience. And if the purpose of your being there, you know, requires you to get more closer, you know, understanding of what you want to know, then investing in a translator is very important. Okay, thank you. Right? Any. 
other comments? You want to say something? Sorry. I, uh, I, I wanted to share a funny story. Oh, sorry. It, because it, it's not even about the, a translation. In my case, because I wanted to do archival research, and the years are counted in a different way um, prior to 1912, prior to the Chinese Revolution. So I go to the archives and they say, okay, this is uh, the 10th year of the reign of Emperor Qianlong. So try to calculate it to see what year that is in, in Western years. It's like, I, I, I don't know how to calculate the years that uh, an emperor has ruled. I don't even know when he started. So I have to go back to where the emperor started ruling in Western years and calculate 10 years into that to know what year we're talking about. It was challenging. <laughs> so yes, you do need translators sometimes. Uh, unfortunately not, but I think you know, uh, people have used the uh, you know, opportunity to spend time, you know, as Michaela did, part of her time in Cambodia, but we want most of our grants to be used for either spending time in India or China, but if you are in India, Bhutan is not that far, so you can go there or Nepal or pass through Nepal. Sadly, I couldn't find anybody to answer that question. <laughs> okay. There is also a big disconnect in, in uh, or maybe it, I sh it's not fair to say that it's disconnect, because when students nowadays in China, when they study their history, there's so much information that they probably cannot, even if they wanted to, they cannot learn everything. So when I go around and ask people who are in their 20s and 30s, hey, why Shanghai uh, 2,000 years ago had round walls? They're looking at me, are you crazy? Who cares? <laughs> <laughs> but come on, it says that that's the reason why Shanghai is so prominent. <laughs> ah, yeah. <laughs> well, hopefully, you know, next time when we meet, you know, you'll find that answer yeah. from some of the so-called China scholars, right? Yeah, the round walls. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> It's the Mongols. We can blame it, everything on Mongols. Yeah, of course. <laughs> <laughs> then I would definitely suggest if you decide to go to China, to go to both a traditional city like Beijing and then to a modern city like Shanghai because like Mar Marina was saying, they're really different. And the pictures you get from, and the stories you hear from both cities and the way they portray China and the West are different in Shanghai than they are in Beijing or other mm -hmm. traditional cities. Do you guys have any challenges allocating the grant money? Because it, they're far away land, so I think a big chunk of it goes for the airfare. Um, <laughs> do you have to manage from your own finance, finance as well to fund your trips? Find all your friends who have friends on Facebook who live in <laughs> India and China. <laughs> <laughs> so. I guess that the, it's a. Um, you have well the allocation for the for the for the fare for the airfare. And then, well, the second most important part is defining where you're gonna where you're gonna stay. Obviously, if you haven't been there, uh, I was very fortunate to find a place very close to the organization, so it was only a two-minute walk. I mean, it was actually really only a block away, and right next to me, all was, there was also the train station. So I guess also do the research very specifically on having probably two or three options where you're gonna stay, and depending on that, then you can allocate like the rest of the of the things that you're gonna use. Obviously, uh, I could speak for India. It's a very, um, you know, your budget uh, in terms of food and, and transportation, you can use it very, I mean, it's like enough, basically. Uh, well, depending on the days, I guess, but, but it's. Hong Kong is more expensive than New York, mm -hmm. and Shanghai yes. is <laughs> getting there. I think really a lot depends on how long you plan to stay there, your lifestyle, some people, you know, spend money you know, for things that require you know, more resources, so therefore you have to mobilize your own resources. But if you really want to be like a student researcher, then I think uh, our experience
experience is that most of them do somehow manage, you know. But people should expect to put in more resources if you're traveling or if you project requires you to be in Hong Kong or Shanghai, major cities, they, they do cost. You know, the cost of living is much higher there. Yes, please. For your research, did you initiate the project yourself, or did you have like an institution in China or India that you worked with? I mean, um, I guess if you all work for like nonprofits and whatnot. Yeah. Well, yeah. Go ahead. I would say we can go down the line. Yeah, yeah. Oh, um, well, for me, I mean, it's a new thing that in order to go to the archives, you need to have affiliation with academic institution in in China. And I could have gotten that, but also my time was too limited. Uh, and now they have other restrictions on archives. But yes, having an institutional affiliation or having someone who is within the institution becomes extremely important if you're looking at archival work. Um, otherwise, I, I don't know because. Yeah, I was gonna say that um, at, at the like at the beginning of the uh, like writing the proposal, I already knew what the topic was going to be about. So after that, I tried to research and also have at least two or three options of, of the places. Um, and then, well, after this defining, like there was uh, one music organization in Mumbai and the other one in Delhi. And then also like talking to to well the institute itself they, they were recommending it. it's only better like to focus in one place and to like base yourself there uh, I think that was like a great option and also the, well with music we are still working I'm like developing their website like renovating their website uh, working on the video profiles for the people for the participants the, their parents so it, it was a very good like choice I don't know how was how would have been with the other uh, with the Delhi institution. But, uh, but yeah, I guess the most important part is like once you know that you're going to actually do that project, then get, you know, keep constant uh, contact with, with the organization. I had Skype meetings, uh, like, you know, getting more of the head of time. Yeah. I think it depends on the kind of project that you want to have ultimately. Um, I chose not to affiliate with my, myself with any institution um, in either uh, Hong Kong, Shenzhen, or Phnom Penh. Um, because I was researching in the garment industry, it's a really touchy issue, um, black labor rights, and uh, I didn't want it to, didn't want my project to get overrun by someone else's agenda. So if you have a really strong idea of what you want to do, um, you know, that, that, and you can't find an organization that does exactly that. Um, I think it's smart to stay independent, and it takes a lot of extra effort, I think, though, because you have to make all your own contacts and um, like find the people, you know, find everyone to talk to, and even find friends to hang out with. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, it just ultimately depends on the kind of project you want to run. Um, I did not have any connections initially, and spent the whole first part of the grant, um, just reaching out to a lot of different NGOs all around India and uh, was getting very few responses as well and then finally came upon uh, Nazdeek after what felt like forever, um, which ended up working out great. But yeah, I started with no connections and that was actually a big struggle for me. Initially, I thought it would be very easy to reach out to people and say, hey, I'll come work with you for free. And, but very few responses, um, so I think finding a strong partner is helpful. Yeah, I also think it depends on the project, but uh, you, I think you do need to have someone strong that will connect you to the people so you can actually access to the people that has the information, otherwise they are not gonna talk to you. I, I think uh, two things that you should also understand. Uh, one is we call this deliberately exploratory grants, travel grants. And I, I think when you think about, you know, affiliations or approvals, there, there are two levels. One is what uh, Marina is indicating, right? If you are thinking about government approval or official, official approval, those things require a lot of time and a lot of planning beforehand. You know, if you are doing serious, you know, doctoral research, ethnographic research, then you know most departments and universities would prepare you and there's a whole step you go through that and that takes a while okay 
But I think these are really travel grants. So in most of our cases, people really don't have the, you really, it's realistically not, you know, uh, possible to get official permission. So, so it doesn't surprise. Because in fact, you travel as a tourist, you know, because to get an official student visa, research visa, b both in India and China is a lot more cumbersome and a uh, you know, very, very, you know, complicated process. Uh, however, I think, you know, when it comes to uh, the importance of affiliation, I think I agree that it depends on the project, but affiliation at two levels. One is who is going to be your institutional partner, you know, whether it's a civil society organization or a university-based department or you know, even a private sector you know, entity. Uh, having someone, uh, an, an, an office of some uh, type, uh, I think uh, becomes your so-called home base. And then from there you can you know, build additional context, I think. Uh, is uh, something that we uh, strongly advise uh, anyone going to India and China. And then on top of that, the importance of you know networking individual you know uh, uh, individuals in these countries either through your new school uh, uh, networks or EC networks, I think are very very uh, crucial in making sure that you end up having a very you know robust and uh, productive uh, experience. Any last minute comment? Okay, well, okay, last well, question. Well, it's really simple. Did you guys feel lonely in any of the time you were there? Because I know, I mean, you travel for, you have an objective. You know what you want to do, but sometimes you need people around you. Um, the very first day I got there, I, I was feeling lonely, and then I I talked to my sister and I never felt lonely in my life. <laughs> and I was like, I never felt like this. Like, what do I do? Like, what do I, 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 I only my computer. I, I didn't even have Wi Fi. I was like, what do I do? And, like, and she was like, Karina, just you tell me, just go outside. So I just literally went outside of my room, met a couple of people, went out with these strangers, and I started my adventure. <laughs> like, you just kind of have to just throw yourself out there. It'll come naturally. I think. I don't know about that. Yeah, I, mean, I was fortunate. The group I was working with was really friendly and ended up introducing me to a lot of people kind of in our age group, although I was younger than a lot of them, but uh, that was fun. The one thing that was kind of a bummer was I was there, the last weekend I was there was Independence uh, Day, and I thought that would be a big, like, kind of celebration, fun way to end my trip, but a lot of the people that I had met in the month prior were on vacation because you got a day off. Um, so they ended up leaving before I was leaving, so the last weekend was kind of sad and I was by myself, but other than that, it was very easy to meet people and have a really good time. Okay, well, uh, I think uh, it is true that, you know, when you go to uh, foreign, you know, places, uh, new places, uh, loneliness is something that, you know, does, you know, uh, come as part of the so-called, you know, experience, right? But, uh, but I think people have written about them, you know, how when you're doing especially long field research, that how that can be very uh, challenging, but as time passes, those are the times, you know, when you look back and you say, you know, there were moments or there are ideas that emerge that shape, you know, what you do the rest of your life. So on that note, loneliness is not necessarily bad. <laughs> actually good, you meditate. Uh, I want to thank you all for really uh, coming uh, to uh, our conversation. We will continue to uh, find ways to really uh, host events. I know we were, in Thomas and I, we were talking about if he, when, when he finishes his uh, documentary, maybe uh, sometime towards the end of this semester or even, you know, early next semester, we'll try to have one evening, pizza evening or something like that where the you know, students can come together and really celebrate and share a bit more on you know how student engagement in some way shapes what we do at ICI. So stay tuned and, uh, and we hope to uh, see you around and uh, thank you again to all of you uh, and thanks to my ICI team, you know, many of them. Uh, can you raise your hands all the ICI volunteers and students who work there, a bunch of them here. So really, <laughs> often I don't get to and I forget, you know, uh, to thank them, you know, but they really uh, make you know the institute really uh, a fun place to be, you know, at, and, and I'm thankful to all of you. Thank you. <laughs>